Y'all, y'all want to get started? So um, right. I'm going live on YouTube right now. Excellent. Okay, got it. Well, welcome everyone. Um, let me get my screen shared again. Let, let me explain what Yuga and I are doing here. First of all, um, we just don't like to charge for anything we do. Let me explain why. We believe in more together. We don't want to know more than you or to be more skilled than you. We want to know more and be more skilled with you. And I think Hugo can echo me on this very strongly. Um, since we started being part uh, of this, and I mean, I, yeah, I'm the founder, but I'm still part of it because I, I am a, a recipient also. And what we found is that we've grown more because we're helping other people. And uh, now I get people reaching out to offer me for help when in my posts, I say something about not knowing something very well. So it's been a real blessing. And well, what are we doing here? We're taking Python lessons to help us understand linear algebra better. And we're learning linear algebra as we learn Python. So it's going both ways. And I've encouraged everyone to watch the lectures in order from Saul Khan on Khan Academy, because in my opinion, he's one of the best teachers of all times. And I figure why reinvent his teachings, we can just understand them even more deeply uh, by practicing what he's teaching in Python. Hey, Shyam, thanks for the hi over here in the chat and hi to everyone, just by the way. So let me share the notebook we worked on in our first uh, linear algebra lesson. And we'll get started. And I decided to try an experiment today. Um, and if it doesn't work, my sincerest apologies, but I, I think it might work great. We'll, we'll see. Clean this over. And then, oh wait, I gotta stop sharing and reshare, my bad. Oh, I keep doing the wrong one. My apologies. I actually do know how to use um, Zoom sharing, but I'm just being a bit of an imbecile this morning. There we go. There's the right one. My uh, screens are not ordered in the best order. Okay, so this is the notebook that we went through the last time we were together. And let's see. There we go. Make this just a little bigger. Okay. And what I did is I took the time in this notebook and um, I'll share this. Most of you should have the address to this, but I'm going to go ahead and share this uh, in our chat for this Zoom session. So you can get to it if you want to follow along because my scrolling might drive you crazy, um, won't be intentional, just to uh, explain things. So I put a link to the section to Khan Academy here for the vectors and spaces. And then there were these seven lectures and we didn't cover all seven of them. We covered enough to understand how you could go further. So basically I gave you some tools, uh, uh, like a Lego set of uh, math that you could take a little further. Now, what I'm gonna do is run all of these. They'll run lightning fast to this notebook. And you've noticed I've switched to dark mode. I, in, in other words, this is the Chrome experimental dark mode. And it's actually hiding our axes over here for our map plot live plots, which is okay. But let me briefly go through this, and then we're going to try a new style of doing this lesson that I think will be more helpful. But please do take time to go back through this. I tried to 
annotate everything and note it very carefully and show you the code for it. But um, this was us just showing our trick, um, what one way to create um, little white, very short segment lines that were at the edges of our uh, plot. So I've got one down here at uh, two and one going, in other words, it's going um, from two, x equals two uh, to x equals one backwards and it's white. So on the white background, it just shows up as white. This is our way. And then one at the other corner I care about doing this is our way of creating a white background so that we can then draw vectors with this arrow um, function in the uh, plot module of matplotlib uh, pyplot. So um, then I, I showed how to break a vector into two components. And so we usually say I, for the uh, x direction and j for the y direction. So I, I have a horizontal vector here. Um, then we started playing with some that were two dimensional. And I show you how we represent those here. I show you how we can get the magnitude of that vector. And uh, of course, relying on the three, four, five principle in uh, trigonometry that if, uh, a right triangle with sides three and four has a hypotenuse of phi. So if we were looking at this uh, as described, we'd have um, a vector that was four in the horizontal direction and then three in the vertical direction, or excuse me. Yeah, that's right. This, this graph is just not scaled the way we might want it to be. And to, to keep it scaled equally, um, when you're setting up these short segments, you just want to make sure they're square. So in other words, to make this one look a little better, it'd probably be wise if, um, let's see. So this is uh, from x, y, one to, uh, or so point one, which has got an, uh, an x and a y to a point two, which has got an x and a y. Um, and uh, so to make this more square, all we would need to do is uh, change this one also to seven, nine, and eight. I believe that's right. Something's making me doubt myself there. Yeah, and now you can see that, oh yeah, we went three in the, uh, X direction and four in the Y, but because I went to dark mode, it's hiding my, my tick values, which is okay. We just need to be careful to make it more proportional, or you can keep yours out of dark mode. Uh, then we showed the principle of how we add two vectors. And so um, we took the, the I hat components, the ones in the horizontal direction and the, um, J hat components, the one in, in the vertical uh, direction. And we just added them up. And then we showed that we can just add those uh, individual components up and square them to get the magnitude like we did before and, and take the square root. So please do take the go, time to go back through these. This was um, another example, and we can uh, change, do that same change here, of how to get that white canvas. Uh, once we plot one point on it, we can just say what the X limit is and the Y limit to get our, our platform here for this. And so here we show us uh, adding uh, those two vectors and, uh, and going on. Uh, by the way, please ask questions as we go. This is meant to be interactive. So, um, how do you find the magnitude of a vector numpy though? You um, use the norm or short for Euclidean norm. So we, we want to kind of learn it without numpy, but then use the numpy function. So we're also not just learning Python better, but we're learning numpy too, because it's very powerful. 
And it's the basis for pandas and SciPy and um, other things. And, uh, um, oh, and scikit-learn. And um, all of those packages can readily take in NumPy arrays and, and use NumPy functions with them. E also Visual Python, guys, I should have said that. So um, what this is showing is that once we've declared some array, which can represent a vector as a NumPy array, and this is the way we do it. And let me remind you up here in case you're really new, notice that we imported NumPy as NP. When we say as NP or as PLP, P, PLT, we're able to access everything in NumPy and everything in matplotlib.pyplot using this alias. So it's just a little more uh, efficient when we're coding. We don't have to type as much. So we'll go back down here and you notice I repeat it every once in a while, just because um, maybe I started from that point when I was teaching from this notebook another time. Um, but the point here is to show once they are treated as NumPy arrays, we can just add them. They, they will take um, the first position of this array plus the first position of this array to make the first position of V3, et cetera. And so you can see that when we added, let's remember what V1 and V2 are. They're right up here. Let me stick some space out. Uh, one, two, and two, two. Well, that was so that as I add these, I get uh, three. And as I add these two, I get four. And that's exactly what happened, three and four. And then the norm, the, the hypotenuse, the magnitude of this vector that has um, I hat three and J hat four is five. Well, then, we talked about scaling vectors in NumPy, as Salt Khan shows in uh, one of his videos in this section. And so if we say four times V1, it readily gives us uh, the two, two now becomes eight, eight, and the one, two now becomes four, eight. So this is very handy to work within NumPy to do these operations, but when you're not sure you understand what's going on, it is great to break it down into pure Python. And we will try to do that. And when you don't quite understand something that's going on in NumPy, please let me know and we'll break it down into pure Python first. Okay, and we can uh, just add our scaled vectors and we can print that addition right here. And then we can get the norm of that uh, addition of those two scaled vectors and print. And this mag is for magnitude. Well, then um, we talked about how to create unit vectors. And the importance of a unit vector is to show that if we got their norm, they would sum up to one. But how do you get? the components, that is each of these values, of a unit vector. Well, you literally just take uh, the, the magnitude, the norm, and you take your original vector and you divide that original, each of the components of the original vector by that magnitude or by the norm, the L2 norm. That just means the Euclidean norm where we take the square of each, we square each component and then take the square root of the sum. And that's uh, clearly explained up here in one of the uh, notes, yeah, up here. So by the way, this is all two dimensional because it's easy to illustrate, but you could do this with three dimensions, four dimensions, infinite dimensions if the computer can handle it. Now, just to show that we truly did get a unit vector, we took each of those unit vectors, like this one, and we did their norm. And then I just did the round command here to say round it to two places. 
because if I didn't have that, we'd get on some of these 0 0.99999 for out for a long time. So the we did in fact get the unit vector. Well, what's important about this? We know that if we multiplied any of these unit vectors by one, we get a magnitude of length one in that direction described by these components. But then if we multiply it by anything smaller or greater than one, we start to scale that vector up and down. Now with that known, and, and that's what this final note is saying, if you multiply your unit vectors by a magnitude or a scalar, you will get a vector in the same direction with a different magnitude. And so at this point, we start our new section. Now in this section, um, Stahl Khan just had one video that was 20 plus minutes long. It was a really, really good one. And I figured it would be best if we only covered the contents of that video this morning, but please, I know y'all uh, might be shy um, and that's okay. But if you're really shy and don't wanna come off mute, please ask in the chat or you can even ask Hugo privately and he can rephrase your question. But the best option would be, don't be afraid to suck at asking a question. Just go ahead and ask it and we'll help you. We'll, that way we can query you to understand what you're really asking and, and get you a good answer. So, um, and this might, I'm hoping this won't go any slower, but I noticed it takes me a little less time to come up with these notebooks than it does to teach them. So I thought you guys might learn better if you saw me doing this real time. I'm, I'm at least hoping that, but if it doesn't work out, I'll prepare them ahead of time. Now, I wanna show you first of all, because this is important to doing good notebooks. You see, we've got some math up here and I'm lazy. So I come up here and I think, oh yeah, yeah, that's how I write um, latex math. By the way, latex, L-A-T-E-X, is ancient. Um, latex existed, I think, before Microsoft Word. And it, it produced, it still does, produce beautiful technical publications with outstanding math, as you see represented here. Well, it's still something you can learn you, in a... Uh, I like the way a friend of mine in grad school said it when I asked him, is it hard to learn? He said, you know, you can, you can learn it in an hour and master it in a lifetime. And I found that's, that's pretty accurate. But we'll take just the, a copy of these. Uh, I'll copy selection. Oh, let me get the, to get this back to normal. We just double click on that part, the, the, the rendered part, we'll call it. We'll go back in here and we'll just copy those in here, but we're, we're going we're gonna to use these in a special way. We'll just use those same values. So what Call, Saul was talking about this last time was that you can do uh, linear combinations and figure out once you have a set of vectors, you can figure out the span that they create. And if you take the time to really go through this uh, code, understand the math and think about it. And, and just keep over, over time, keep trying to understand what we're gonna cover better to get, uh, what we're gonna cover together. Keep trying to understand it better over time. This will really help you uh, be philosophical, linear algebras, uh, you, you really want to, over time, you don't have to be perfect at linear algebra to get a great start in machine learning and in data science and artificial intelligence. But if over time you get better and better, it's only gonna help you in those arts. So what I wanna point out here is if, if we have V1 and V2 again, we can also say that V3 is some linear combination of those two. Now, right now, I'm gonna use a new word. 
I'm going to say uh, V1, V2 are independent. Just hoping that show up right away. Now, what does that mean? It means there's no math I can do. Like I, there's no scalar I can multiply on V2. <clears throat> that will make it exactly equal. Excuse me a minute. <clears throat> that will make it exactly equal V1. And there's no scalar that I can multiply on V1 to make it exactly equal V2. Now, if you think about that for a minute, that's really profound because as we lay these out on plots, what's gonna become apparent is that they, they can relate to one another, but they can also define spaces as we scale them, just like that's why we made such a big deal about the unit vectors and scaling them or, or scaling any of these vectors. But here's the point. <clears throat> V3, some V3 could also be uh, some C1, and that one, that underscore one gives me an underscore, and it's some coefficient, it's some scalar, it's, it's some, just a number without direction. Vectors have direction, but these are just scalars. And I'm going to just say, um, I'm not worried anymore about this because we've learned that. So I'll just replace all that with that. Um, dollar sign at the end. And so we're saying um, we can say that sum V3 equals C1 C1 times v vector 1 and C2 times vector 2. I think up above, I should have said uh, V3. Let's go fix that while we're here. Don't want that confusing anyone. I probably did a copy and paste error when that happened. There we go, it's correct on the other line. Hmm. Don't worry about my coughing guys, it's just, I'm pretty sure it's just allergies. Now, we want to ask a question here already. Oh. And I hope this is helping you watch me work real time to figure out how you would do it yourself. So I'm going to ask a different question here. How much space Could be spanned by using many different values for, and we're going ahead and see one. We're just doing this in line here. And see two. And we don't need this uh, V3 part anymore with what we're asking. So let, let's, let's think about this. We're saying there could be a whole family of V3s. We're not going to change V1 and V2. We're going to keep them fixed at these values. But as I go from, let's say, negative infinity to positive infinity for C1 and negative infinity and positive infinity for C2. And C1 and C2 are independent in value from one another. Well, how much space could be spanned using those many different values for C1 and C2? Well, let me go on ahead and give an answer to that. 
it would be all real values in two dimensional space. Again, why? Because as you can see, there's no value of C1 or no value of C2 where I can make V1 and V2 equal one another. Now there's a fancy way to do that. Um, you see how quickly I can pull this up. I had a, I'm looking for uh, something that will help y'all and I'll put it in the chat. Oh joy. I think I better go look. I should have had this prepared. My bad. So I'll go look for it from my uh, links. Oh, you know what? I should do this where y'all can see it. My bad. So I'm just going to open this up, go to my bookmarks. I try to keep my bookmarks really uh, well uh, organized. And I go to my latex links. <laughs> I think this is the one I want. Yes. And I'm looking for uh, notations. And uh, this, th there's many of these out there. This, um, this is a good one that uh, you can use in various, uh, I use this one in WordPress. That's why it's called KTEX. Let me get a drink, guys. Now, Compared to the first lecture, this one's kind of more philosophical. It's, it's, to me, it's one of those great boundaries. Well, there's no boundary. It's one of those stronger mixtures of philosophy and math. <clears throat> okay, trying to think here, let's see. Oh, it's over here. Okay, letters in the code layout. Logic and set theory. I think we're just going to have to scroll. I'm looking for a special character. I may have to do a separate search for it. <clears throat> but I want you all to be familiar with it because as you're learning to read math, it's something you would come across. So we've got all these ways to do Greek letters and other letters. Oh, there it is. This is what we want. What does this represent? And you could go and do a search for mathematical symbols, but this one has a special meaning for us. <clears throat> In other words, it will, it, oh, there's a best way to write this. Um, <clears throat> um, so how do we do this? It's back. And then what do we want to be a vector? Um, v3. And so uh, I'll go ahead and put a dollar sign at the end. And then the other symbol we need is the include symbol. And I know we'll, we'll write, oh, here's two different ways to, to do that one, reals and r. But I'm looking for a special mathematical symbol that means that uh, included in, and it's uh, it looks quite a bit like an epsilon. Let's see if that's that's, but it's not. It I'll go ahead and use epsilon, but I believe there's another symbol that works better. But epsilon will work for us. Is included in, and did we get it? Yes, and I'd like a little more space here. So I'm gonna use this trick. It's probably my favorite one to create extra space. And then we'll do that uh, for R, oh, R. And that's, oh, it is, what? That may be that there's a weakness there. Let's try it. 
Nope. Okay, something it does not like. Why is that backslash there? Do not want that. See if it's caused possibly. No, that is very disconcerting. You may have to let that go and fix it later, but that's uh, quite setting for me. Let's try this reels. Maybe that'll work. It could be that this has a limited um, area or uh, I've, I've experienced this before. Oh, darn. It does seem like it's getting the type of, no, it's not. I wonder. Well, we'll do that for now. That's not near as good as we want. <laughs> but we'll leave it be for now. For some reason, uh, these are not working in here. There may be another world or a way, um, and maybe we can find that letter later. Um, looks like this double strut could work, um, but I'm not quite sure how they're suggesting you use that. And this, these are, um, I've found very few of these that won't work inside of a, a notebook, a Google Colab notebook, but I think we better move on. Um, this fancier uh, italicized R is also sometimes used for all real numbers, but what we wanna say is in two dimensional space, or actually the way they normally do it, this could be confusing. It's not meant to be R squared, but all real numbers in two dimensional space. So that's what we're trying to say. It would all be, <laughs> it would be all real numbers in two dimensional space. That's how much space can be spanned by all possible V3 vectors as we use negative infinity to positive infinity for C1 and negative infinity and positive infinity for C2 and all possible combinations of that, we could get a vector, uh, a different vectors that would cover all of the real numbers in two dimensional space. Now, we could continue. If we can show independence for a, uh, let's say these are now 3D vectors and traditionally, uh, we would call that some number on the unit vector of k hat. And so now we're in 3D space and we could have C1 on V1, C2 on V2, C3 on V3, and then have some V4. And the same thing would be true for V4 for three-dimensional space. In fact, now that we're at it, <clears throat> Let's just repeat all this and say that, and then we'll get into some fun uh, exercises. And if anyone, uh, if everyone's okay with it, uh, we can go a little longer today because we weren't able to do the pipeline class today. Oh, I did not want to do that. Okay. So we'll say the same can be true or independent vectors in, um, let's go ahead and do it the fancy way, uh, R3. So we have um, some vector V1, some vector uh, V2, but now we need to say, let's steal this. It's always good to be constructively lazy, right? Um, I'm gonna say, why is, I am uh, just looking at what I'm doing here. Oh, okay, right. Um, 
we're going to just call this uh, three. <clears throat> so we got one, two, three, but the hat is going to be on K now. Again, I hat is a unit vector in the X direction. J hat is a unit vector in the Y direction. And K hat is a unit direction in the Z direction. And that would mean the other two components of each of these unit vectors would be zero. They point in those uh, directions. And then for the other vector, and if we hit return, that'll just help us look at this better and it won't change the way it's laid out. Um, we're gonna say V2, we'll keep that. But again, I think that's still in my keyboard buffer, yes. Uh, we'll call this, I think this will work, a one to keep them independent, that is, on K hat. And so uh, any combination of those, uh, and we're just going to use two vectors again. Any combinations of those <clears throat> could fill all of three-dimensional space. And then I'll say, et cetera, or more than three dimensions. Now, I can imagine that this might be messing with some of your minds. Um, but I'm hoping it's it's clear. Now it may be that you're you're like, okay, I believe what you're saying, but I just don't completely get it yet. That's okay. It's okay if you're there. Um, what we want is that you at least understand what these are saying. Now it may take time though for you to believe it uh, and and be able to prove it to yourself. Okay, someone had their hand raised. Go on ahead. Okay, Papa, it's me. Um, Great. What, what you're saying now just clicked as I'm, there was something you just mentioned now and I saw the transformation and he answered a question I had. Um, I don't know if you could allow me to share my screen. Um, oh, go on ahead, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let so, me stop sharing. Okay, so let me just share because over the over the holiday, I was also trying to read up on on some of this um, linear algebra and how it it works in machine learning. So, um, one of the first applications that I found for linear algebra and machine learning was the transformation as in between features and targets because. Um, in one of the papers I was reading, the, the person described that when you have an array of features, for example, you have maybe this, this first might be, for example, in maybe the iris data set or the diabetes data set or whatever, this might be maybe height. Um, sorry, let me just get that fixed. So this, this might be the height and right. this might be the weights, and this might be maybe age, and this might be maybe um, any other feature. And then this is the target, whether maybe diabetes or not diabetes and stuff like that. So one of the things that just clicked for me now was when you, when you mentioned that um, issue of transformation, because it was one of the things I've been asking myself that since all of these are matrices, this is a vector, the target is a vector, while this is a matrix depending on the size of the features. So um, I, I wondered how the inversion of this matrix would help. I, I, I know by normalizing this matrix that we would, we would probably, and that's the function, I think that's what's this uh, min max scalar or the standard scalar does a scikit learn and tries to normalize all of them, you know, to bring them between zero and one. And what just clicked for me now was when you talked about exploding the spaces, because 
Um, this can also be features in maybe like a computer vision task. It can also be matrices in the computer vision task where you use the, the matrices to represent the pictures. And then you, um, PCA means you, you try to get the eigenvalues and all that. But when you now mentioned the movements from 1D space to 3D space, that's when I started sketching this. I was like, okay. So yeah, this is a, like, good. for example, when you're trying to move from maybe the grayscale, because grayscale is just one dimension. So all the um, matrices and all that are just one dimension. And then you want to expand the dimension to three. That's RGB, red, green, blue, you know, and stuff like yeah, that. So that's, yeah. yeah, so it's now beginning to all come together. And, right. and I'm not, I'm not <laughs> trying to know, okay, so maybe you could talk more, maybe when you're done with the presentation, you could also talk more on what are the techniques that we can, we can use? Because some of these techniques, like the inverse of this matrix, I know um, I, I was told that when you want to invert a function, or when you want to, one of the ways to try to solve a function is to find its inverse. So, but I'm, I'm also trying to find out what other applications can the inverse of this matrix give us when we are looking at an array of features and the target and, and stuff like that? I'm sorry, I'm sorry I interrupted you. A lot of things are just going through my head. No, so I thought... this, is, this is great, Hugo, and you're, you're getting it. Oh, I wish you hadn't stopped sharing. Oh, okay, I could, I could, I could continue yeah, sharing. Let me, let me lecture from your screen for a minute. Okay. So that was very good. And <clears throat> I will be creating something like this, but with code and LaTeX. But this is great, Hugo. So let's let's think about this, everyone. Each of these features, which is a column, as Hugo is showing, that's really one of those uh, hat vectors, right? That we're saying they're independent from one another, but each each uh, record, or each in in this case each row, um, has each of those uh, dimensions, each of those uh, components, I should say. So the vectors are the rows, but the components of each of the vectors are the columns. And, and that's typically how we lay things out so that we are always speaking the same way to one another. <clears throat> and what we're actually looking for, Hugo, is another vector Let's call this the big A matrix right here. I don't, I'm hoping everyone can see my mouse. I bet you can't. But this matrix that's called the features, we're gonna call that the big capital A matrix or the features matrix. And we've got the targets, that's right, the, or the labels, but there's another vector. There you go, very good, you go. And then over here, uh, to the right of your target vector, uh, call that equals big B. Now, we can call, it's been called many things, but there's a vector just to the right of the big A matrix um, called, uh, we can call it the weights, we can call it the coefficient vector, we can call it X. It, right. I've seen it called all of those. Excuse me, hang on. <laughs> Allergies. When we're doing the training or we're doing the solution to find a predictive model, it's the work of finding those coefficients. So can you um, copy this left brace of the A matrix and move it to the right of the A matrix. You have the ability to do that. Okay, let me try. Uh, so I'm just going to remove this and I should take this to the right. Oh, just, we're just looking for that right bracket, the left bracket of A. Okay. And moving it, to, yeah, so you can, Actually, oh, that's fine. So we just need that that one. Yeah, just make a copy of that one and move it to the right of A. Okay. Uh, 
this? Yep. And then make a copy of the right bracket and move it to the right of that new bracket you made, you uh, pasted. Okay. So, and then uh, put an equal sign between that new set of brackets and the target one. <clears throat> Very good. So I'm going to put an equal sign here, uh, just here. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Now, if there's a fast way, we just want to fill this with C1 through C6 in this new one. So there you go. C3, Very good. C4, C5, and C6. Excellent, excellent. So what this is saying is if we multiply this uh, six by four matrix on this, hang on a minute. I apologize. We need to make this a, uh, this needs to be a, Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm trying to put this properly. <clears throat> we need to shorten this one so it only goes to C4. Okay. Is that easy to do? Absolutely. So, it's okay to leave. It, well, it would be good if we can shorten the brackets too. Okay. Yeah, so that it can it can multiply the other matrix. Yes. Right. And um, what we're doing, and, and these targets, it's not like we can't have more targets, but um, if we were going to train this in a closed form, um, well, the way you've shown it, we would have to use a, a least Square's version of linear algebra to get that many target answers. But if, um, if, the, if the data wasn't very noisy and uh, we eliminated these two bottom rows from the features um, and we only had the four targets over here on the right also, we could um, solve for those C's and have pretty good values. But typically, um, we overload this and we do a version of least squares in the linear algebra realm so that we can uh, get values that deal with the noise <clears throat> in the target values and in the features. And um, it, it's, again, it's a ordinary least squares version linear algebra edition of order. <laughs> Darn these allergies. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, it's me. Um, an, um, a uh, ordinary least squares version of doing a linear algebra solution or a linear algebraic version of doing an ordinary least squares uh, solution some mathematician out there is cringing as I try to say it this way, but the point being, there's a way to uh, square A and do some slick things that we are gonna go over in, a, in probably the next lecture where we solve for these C values, but we'll first do it with perfectly square, a perfectly square A matrix. And then we'll see how to do it in the ordinarily square sense for more rows than, uh, than we have for columns. Sorry, but, but what, what you just said now is just describing one thing, back propagation, because that's the process um, where we no. calculate the weights. Actually, and... it's not, hang on, it's not back propagation. Okay. It's a, it, when we have a square A matrix, right. and we only have uh, four values for the target and four weights, we, we can do that in what we call a closed form solution. And okay. even when we have um, 
many more, like let's say we had a hundred rows for A, but we still just had the four features or the four columns. <clears throat> and then we had, uh, you know, a certain number of target values and maybe we didn't have all the target values. So we're, we're training to figure out. <clears throat> yeah. So we use the value, we use the uh, records, the vectors um, that we've broken down into features for columns, the records are the rows. So that's each individual species that's got this uh, target value B1, let's say for the first record of the first species, like in a classification or the, et cetera. <clears throat> we, we can do that and it, it deals with more and, and we can even do that in a closed form solution where it, where it goes to where we can't use closed form solutions. We're gonna go over all of this again in case we're losing some of y'all. Um, we go to gradient descent. Now, as we talk about gradient descent, um, because maybe we're doing this on um, classification or we're adding some normalization techniques. Now we're getting closer to what we do in back propagation. But to learn back propagation principles, we're going to need to understand just a little bit of calculus principles too. So I hope that helps you go. Yeah, because I was, we, I, was we, I was just trying to find out um, where the math moves from linear algebra to calculus because at, at the point we have to switch from matrix algebra and we have to go to, especially when we have to do the gradient descent, we have to look for the local minima. Yes. So, so basically, immediately. yeah, it, just so you know, um, we're crossing a wide river to get to back propagation. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the first couple of stepping stones so far. <laughs> I hope that helps. Absolutely. But we still have many more stones to learn how to step on so we don't get swept down the river. And it's not a dangerous river. You just get knocked in the water, have to swim to the bank and start over again. <coughs> okay, I'll go back to my screen. All right, share. Now, is it okay with everyone? <clears throat> if we keep going, because we are at eight o'clock or a little after eight o'clock. I'm just gonna assume yes, if I don't see anyone drop off and uh, you watch for me too, you go, maybe someone will tell you private. I, I don't want anyone to miss. We've actually covered quite a bit. We've just done it more philosophically today. <clears throat> but, um, we can really take what we were doing above and reuse it and change it up a little bit. So um, let's start with this again. Copy that selection that we just made. And we'll put this in here, but we're gonna do something just a little different. We're going to say three times that and four times this, and that's going to be our V3, but we'd also like to plot it. So let's just go get some of our cool plot routines from a pub. And we won't have to do as much this time, I don't think. Um, and let's go on ahead and do our imports just in case someone comes along and wants to use this by itself. Have to, okay, I'll try to tell you keystrokes I'm using in case you think that's cool. I'm holding the Alt key down and doing the up arrow key. Move these up. And then I'm just doing end and giving a couple of spaces there. Okay, so we've defined these two vectors. Um, we don't need any, we need that. Now let's make a guess at how big we're gonna go. We're gonna go 
uh, upwards of eight. So let's make this 10 by 10 this time. Again, this, these first two lines here are the trick um, to do what we want. And we don't need these individual ones because we're defining them in NumPy arrays. But now <clears throat> we need to do um, a starting point. So I'm going to go on ahead and make uh, the starting points. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's just look at uh, V3, in fact. That'll help. And we can make copies of it. We're going to just always start at 1, 1, or at least for now. Now, how do we deal with this? Well, let's get good at NumPy, because we know how to do it in pure Python. And if you don't, just ask. But for this first one, uh, we just want um, it, it's just it's just a one dimensional array. So we only need the zero component. And here we need the second component or the first and second component. Again, when we're numbering in code, it's from zero to just before the number of values we're going to have. And we'll keep these things the same. You can change the color if you wanted. And um, we're calculating the norm up here, so we don't need that stuff. And um, we'll still print V3, but why don't we do uh, V3 mag directly in the fly? Hope you all like that idea. So this will be um, vector v3 equals, no, oh, it's already there, good. And then um, that's just, uh, we'll get one space here. I think we're good to go. Oh, wait, uh, <clears throat> that was when we were doing all three. So I think we can get rid of this one. We're just creating the text at, uh, let's go out a little bit, we'll go to three, one. And that'll be along <clears throat> the y equals one level, but we'll just see how it works. Oh, I didn't account for something very well in the limits. So uh, x lim zero to 10, y lim. Looks like my y, oh, I went to 14. I wasn't paying attention somehow. I've got three times v1. Oh, but I'm I'm uh, I'm adding these together. That's what I failed to recognize. So I just need to make my limits uh, bigger, and it's already giving me a hint. Well, let's go fifteen by fifteen, so it'll still be square. Uh oh, boy. Oh, but then I have to, that's probably right at the tip and we're just not seeing the arrow. So I'll just do 20. And y'all can fine tune this for your own needs. Again, you'll be able to make a copy of this and then change it for your own fun. So it's got a really small arrowhead there. And then let's round that so we don't have to look at so much that. <clears throat> Okay, that should all look a little nicer now. Oh, oh, it must be too rounded to 0 0.20, so that's why it came out that way. And then um, let's slide the origin, the starting point of this vector up to like uh, 3, 3, just look a little more centered in this plot. And um, now I hope this is all making sense to y'all, but what I want to impress upon you, we're we could start this at zero, zero, by the way. But as I change, and you could do an experiment with this, uh, just use integer values, I would. But nest V3 into, uh, well, y'all, maybe we just do this together. So, um, but before we go there, uh, to make this a little more easy, I'm going to just define my coefficients up here. So we'll do it this way first. So we see that we get the same thing. Make sure we know what we're doing. 
And if I run that again, sure enough, I get the same thing. I just made this more of a defined variable method this way. Well, just to impress upon you that we can span all the real numbers in this space, but we, we won't do literally all of them, but we'll do a bunch. Uh, let's do something fun. Um, this time, let's say uh, negative 20 and negative 20. And let's go on ahead and, and look at that. And what we're going to also do is uh, change this uh, to the, you know what, I don't want to change too much yet. I'm going to um, have this start at zero instead, right at the origin. Again, when you're out of dark mode, uh, and I'll try to figure out how to make the, the axes and the tick marks look white on this uh, dark mode. But let's see what we look like now. And then um, we should be okay the way we're going to do this. If we just, um, I'm going to preserve a copy of this. And um, we're going to keep it stuff, but I'm going to say plot.title. And I'm going to put stuff in here. Now, we may not see it because of, um, oh, I'm doing control slash, the slash under the question mark key to comment that out. And my fear is that with this title, let's see if it shows up in this dark mode. It's not. So what I probably need to do, I think I can get away with this. If not, we'll figure it out later. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> there probably is a way to change the color of the axes and the tick marks to white. But now I've got this faint arrowhead. So uh, here's the head width. I'll see if just making it uh, 0 0.5 will look better. Our width looks good. Yeah, that looks nicer. Okay, so I'm going to keep this kind of independent. We could have done this as text here, but we did it as that. And I'm going to redo. Um, let's do it this way. Copy cell, come down here, more code, uh, put it in there. And it, oh, it even copies the uh, output. How nice. I'm going to make that go away though. We're going to do something hopefully that seems clever to <clears throat> really understand these linear combinations and the spans they can create. So, um, this time I'm going to do away with C1 and C2, but I, I'm going to recreate them. I'm going to keep these two vectors fixed. And then I'm going to say for C1 in range, and we're going to go uh, from just what, now, oh, what did I have before? <laughs> Let me be careful here. C, okay, so we're going to go um, <clears throat> from negative three in this loop. So that means it'll literally start at negative three. And we want it to end at four, but, and I'm gonna be redundant here. We're gonna step by one. What this means is it's gonna stop because it's stepping by one, it's gonna stop right before uh, four. So it'll go from negative three to three. And I want yet another for loop for C2 in range. <clears throat> and here we'll go negative four to uh, five and step by one. You don't need the one, one is the default, but I'm just doing it so it's very clear what we're doing. And we only need to show this what we don't. We don't want to, in this case, print the title because we have very, many different magnitudes for these for V3. Again, V3 is going to be plotted once each time. Um, 
it, there'll be a new value for V3 for all these values. And I bet y'all saw that before I did that we need to go in one more. So let's think about what's gonna happen. It's gonna start at negative three and it'll go for all values of uh, negative four to four. And then it'll go to negative two and all values of negative four to four, et cetera. And we're gonna see the span that this creates. Oh, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> and look at that. Isn't that amazing? Well, you can imagine. Look, now, let me let me uh, redo this. So we're not looking at V3 all the time. We just want to see the plot. And in fact, uh, so that this, why don't we go from uh, five to six here instead? And then this way, we won't see all those printouts. Now, you can imagine. If we were go, doing all the fine decimal values that we could, and we were going from negative infinity to positive infinity on each of these, we could literally fill all the real values in uh, two-dimensional space with V3 by using different values of C1 and C2. And that's all we mean by the span. <clears throat> Let's do one other little thing. Let's repeat this same thing. So I'll uh, copy cell. I've always wondered, can I just go down here? This is the um, thing that frustrates me a little bit. Now, if I do, uh, I think you have to do, uh, I, I've been doing control V or shift insert, but it, it always leaves you with this artifact of the one you had to create. So now what, what we just proved too is that these are independent. There's no case where, I mean, when we see these, um, that's if, how do, if these were not independent, we wouldn't have seen R2, but let's make these dependent. In other words, Really, V2 is not independent of V1. In other words, I can come up with a scalar value that will just make that equal to the other one. And um, you know what? I feel like I messed something up now that I'm thinking about where that's going to go. Let me think about this a minute. And if anyone can... Uh, guess what I'm doing? That would be awesome. Oh, also, we didn't really need to do this. We're just plotting it. So I think we're, oh, and we probably, it's bad to do that over and over. I bet we can just do that the one time outside of the for loops. We'll check it. It may be a problem. And then let's just try that again to see if we're okay. I think it might have, no, yeah, it works. So that way we're not calling this over and over again. Um, we're just doing these operations. <clears throat> um, in Saul's lecture though, he did have different values for C1 and C2, but I, I think this point will be proven. Let's just, um, I'll take a risk and, and do it in spite of my concern. So uh, we'll make the same changes we just did above to make this a bit more efficient code. And then let's see how it looks. Ah, this happened exactly like I thought it should. Did the span of these two vectors, linear combinations of these two vectors is just, uh, all real values along one line. In other words, we could define an infinite line, but it, it's a one dimensional space is what I'm trying to say. That proves that these are not independent of one another, whereas these two were. Okay, so let your mind <laughs> chew on that for a bit. And we would find the same if we did this now, um, 
there's there's smoother ways to find that the vectors are dependent or independent from one another. I want to encourage you that you don't have to always do these plots to figure that out. There's very slick linear algebraic ways to figure out that your set of vectors are independent or not. <laughs> but this is just a visual way to see that in fact we had uh, the, these two vectors were not independent of one another um, because they rest on the same line. Their span rests on the same line. Um, let me stop at this point and see, did this excite you? Is this an aha? Um, are you confused? And please, the heroes will say that they're confused. They, so please, uh, any questions or any confusion points at, the, at this point? <laughs> Uh, you go, you're garbled to me. Try again. I said I would I would look at the notebook again and it's, it's looking exciting already. So I'll just look at it again and just absorb this, the, the combination part of this whole equation. Just let it sink in and then I'll see how I can apply it to, to what, what I already know. Yeah. Now, let me ask this, guys. Would you like watching me code while I talked, or do you prefer me to have the notebooks prepared ahead of time? What do you think? <clears throat> it, it, looked, it felt like it went a little slower. We had the good detour with Hugo's questions. OK, watch you while you code. Thank you, Ridwan. Uh, yeah, and please, everyone, revisit the notebook. But, uh, did 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 others like watching me while I code? Because that way you get to watch me troubleshoot my code and stuff too, which I think is valuable. I I mean I don't code perfectly, but I um, code pretty good after doing it for so long. Okay, well I'm going to take it that Ridwan is speaking for everyone. Now, if you haven't already please go watch Saul Khan's video. And you know what? Watch it a couple of times. Go back through the notebook. Um, figure out how to do a 3D version of this. And with Plotly, you can put a plot in here that will rotate inside the notebook. Uh, but if you use the Matplotlib version, you'll want to use it outside the notebook because it doesn't rotate inside the notebooks. And I'll start using th some 3D examples too. But um, <clears throat> again, if you understood how we can make linear combinations of vectors of more than one vector, in other words, we could have had any dimension of any vector dimensionality and any number of vectors to create a new vector. And so it was a linear combination. Why do we say linear? Well, look, this looks like y equals the slope times x. Now, we don't have an intercept. We could, we will, but this is like the equation of a line. It's a linear line, com a combination of lines. They're just multi-dimensional lines. <clears throat> when we learned the equation of the line in high school, that was always in two dimensions. We were saying, well, the output y equals the slope times x plus the y-intercept. And very similar principles, but um, okay. Watch the lectures up to this point. And, and then if you understand all this pretty well, watch ahead, please. But um, watch Saul's lectures <clears throat> and then practice these notebooks. Yes, 